Well, can I, can I, if I can have everybody's attention, I think everybody signed in. We'll try to get started. So first of all, can, can you all in the back of the room hear me? No. Got a better mic? So how's that? Is that better? Can you hear me, Paul? Do you want to hear me? OK. Thank you very much. So uh, for those of you, my name is Buddy Hans. I'm currently the secretary at the Maryland Department of Agriculture. I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight for this public briefing on the PMT, the phosphorus management tool. Uh, based on the current draft proposed reg that's moving through the process at AELR. So my role here at the beginning of the program is to, first of all, talk about why we're here. A lot of people are asking the question, why are we doing this now? You know, what's the rush? Uh, this goes back uh, four years ago when Maryland was working with EPA on its WIP, its Watershed Implementation Plan to meet the TMDL. Uh, a part of that Watershed Implementation Plan called for uh, certain things that we had to do to meet those reductions. Uh, uh, the TMDL reduction says that Maryland has reduced its uh, loading to the Chesapeake Bay by some million something, a little over a million pounds. So it's, it's essentially math. Uh, for every practice, certified practice that you all install, there's a credit assigned to that practice. So we had to demonstrate to EPA that by 2025, we were going to have enough practices on the ground to meet that reduction. So let's say, for instance, a cover crop, I think we get six or seven pound credit for every acre of cover crop. So we have 400,000 acres of cover crop, we get 2.4 million pounds, if my math is correct in that assumption. But anyhow, we had to have enough practices on the ground by 2025 to meet our in-line goal for the TMDL. And because that you all have done such a great job, and as I go everywhere across this state and across this country, I tell everybody, we have the best farmers in this country right here in the state of Maryland. Uh, the, the, issue, the issue that we face is uh, because of the 2025 deadline, uh, those things that we need to do to get us that coal, we have to accelerate. As, as we look back over time voluntarily, we have done major, major things here in Maryland, and which helped us at the end of the day because our, our gap to meet our coal was this size instead of this size. So that, that did help us. A lot of people say all those things we did before didn't help. Well, they did help. They made the goal smaller. And so in the last two years, you've seen us make some changes to regulations that uh, have appeared to be uh, accelerated and in some sense they are. We're trying to put in place those things necessary that as we look forward from here to 2025 will get us to that goal. Part of that WIP, that Watershed Implementation Plan, part of the requirements of EP Day was that we update the Foster Site Index. Uh, some of you are aware that nationwide there was a lot of discussion about the Foster Site Index across the country. And in some programs at USDA there is a number. You can't be above that number. Uh, so uh, EPA knew that the University of Maryland was doing research. They knew that the university was nearing completion of that research. So as part of our WIP, it was required that when the university finished their research on the updated P-Site index, we were to implement that new tool into the nutrient management planning process. So that's why the last several years you've seen us doing the things we're doing. And as part of our WIP, this is the last thing that we need to do that we believe will keep agriculture on the path and get us to the end goal in 2025. By the time we get to 2025, everything will be phased in. We should have enough practices on the ground to meet those goals, and we shouldn't have any problems once we get there. As you all may know, some of you at least know, we are measured every two years on how we're working towards meeting that end goal milestone. So every two years we have what they call a milestone, where EPA comes in, we report practices that we have on the ground. Is this one better? Here, sorry. It's still on. So every two years, EPA, we do a report to EPA that talks about the practices we have that get a credit in the model, 
and uh, an accounting is done of where we are. So what I'm very happy to report to all of you, if you don't know, in the last two milestones, the milestone that ended in 2011 and the milestone that ended in 2013, agriculture is at 130% of its goal. So every two years, working towards 2025, you know, that goal changes. But at least for the first two milestones, we have overachieved our goal by 30%. The reason we've done that is because of the success of the cover crop program to a large extent. Because you all have uh, grasped hold of that program, planted a tremendous amount of cover crops. Uh, two and a half or three years ago, our goal was 350,000 acres. And uh, I argued one day to the governor that there was no way we could meet that goal. The goal was too high. Uh, we couldn't meet it because at that time we were running around 150 to 200,000 acres of cover crops and uh, just didn't believe that in a, in a two year period we could reach our goal of 355. Well, you all made a, a liar out of me. And you all, through your good work, have made sure that for the, at least the last four years we have overachieved our goal. But what happens as you move forward, you know, our goal steadily increases till you get to 2025. Uh, as you know, there's a limited amount of acres in Maryland. We have about 1.1 to 1.2 million acres of cultivated cropland. There, when we do look back at research at the average amount of harvested crops in Maryland by November, the first week of November, which is generally the cutoff for cover crops, uh, there's generally a harvested acreage of about 600,000 acres. So there are always going to be instances where you know, you can't plan on every acre. So we, we feel like we're approaching that window where this, this ceiling, we're going to start to hit a, a glass ceiling. Even though we have 600,000 acres, there's just not going to be the potential to coat a cover crop on all 600,000 acres. And in fact, this year we did see a dip in sign up. Uh, some of you may notice that we didn't do a big splash the end of August or the first of September about cover crop sign up. That's because this year our sign up was about 25 or 30,000 acres under what it had been. So that's going to impact, depending on what gets planted, that will impact on how we work towards our goal in this next milestone. So these other practices, especially those practices that are more permanent, are going to be much more important. Because an annual practice is very variable and there are certain weather related issues that will pop up that will prevent you from planting those cover crops, which has been our mainstay. So these other practices that are more permanent are not so much weather related, are much more important that we get those on the ground to show the permanence as we work towards achieving our goal. So uh, as I said, the university completed, it's uh, Dr. McGrath who headed up that research, concluded that research in October, wrote up a, um, what do you call it? Uh, the, the paper, the draft, the technical bulletin. It's called a technical bulletin, which is the research, uh, the findings of the research that influenced the tool. Dr. McGrath completed that in October. Uh, we drafted up a proposed reg based on that document. Uh, while that document was being peer reviewed through the university process, we also initiated the process to go through the AL AELR committee and the legislative process in Annapolis, which is what's needed to adopt regulations and the Senator Colburn is on that committee and I'll call him up in a little bit to sort of explain that process to you so you fully understand what that is. So we submitted those regs. Uh, we're working through our process. The University of Maryland is working through its process. Uh, we went, concluded that process in February. The regs were passed by the ALR committee. We were uh, on a schedule to implement the new tool on January the 1st of 2013. Once the final document was in place at the university, uh, there was a technical change to that document made by the university during its peer review, which made a small adjustment to the buffers that are in the tool. Uh, our attorneys determined that was a significant change, which triggered uh, our need to go back through the ALR process. Uh, at that time, uh, we were trying to get the tool implemented to capture as much of the 2014 planning season as possible. So we use what's called an emergency status, whereby everything is expedited. Uh, you can go through the ALR process in about 30 or 45 days, and normally it takes at least 90. We did that because as we went through the 
process in January and February, and the rules were actually adopted and approved by ALR. But they were approved by ALR. They're not final until we adopt them. Um, we did get comments from the major farm organizations uh, raising the concerns of the community about the impact that it may have on individual producers and the industry as a whole. Uh, I think we had a total of eight comments come in, mostly from organizations, a few individuals. Uh, the committee, as I said, took into account those comments. We took into account those comments, and, but we proceeded forward. So when we looked at coming back to make this small technical change, it was not significant to the tool. It was just a minor change, even though our attorneys called it significant. But when we went through the emergency process, uh, apparently it woke up a lot of people. And we were accused of rushing through the process, uh, which is, was never our intention. And as I said, we started this back in October. I guess it was unfortunate. Apparently, the word didn't get out enough to the community. But we did go through that process in January and February, the full process. Uh, so hence, uh, the reason that we used the emergency process. It wasn't that we were trying to sneak something through or rush something through. Just trying to get it implemented so that everybody, when you go in to get your nutrient management plans, would be operating under the same guidelines. What we didn't want to do was, what we were trying to avoid, was changing a regulation in the middle of a planning process and have people operating under different standards. That's something that we could not do. And as I said, there's some who say, well, why the rush? Why don't we wait some more? Uh, there are some, EPA and others, uh, who believe that we've already delayed this process because we should have implemented it a year ago. And uh, under the new proposed regs that we're working on today, they see this as a two or three year delay from where we should be. So uh, it's, you know, we're hearing from both sides, certainly completely different arguments and just trying to navigate our way through the middle. Uh, I don't even know where I am now, I'm sorry. Well, why don't I, uh, <laughs> I definitely know where I am. <laughs> why don't I take this opportunity? Senator Coleman is here, as I said, he's a member of the ALR committee, and uh, he's probably the best person in this room to explain to you how that process works and how that process will work moving <laughs> forward. I think that'll be a very good information. Senator? Thank you, Secretary Hanson. We work together on a uh, building, uh, or trying to trying to reduce the lengthy time for uh, building chicken houses and we were together we worked with you on the uh, with, along with Secretary Summers Department of the Environment uh, on uh, on a template that we unveiled here in the Civic Center so we also hopefully you'll work with us on these regulations I just want to give a little history and process on the ALR committee and some of the things I'll say Secretary Hans has already said uh, because uh, I, I, I I'm Senator Colburn. I represent Caroline Dorchester Talbot and half of Wicomico County. Senator Mathias representing the other half of Wicomico, Somerset and Worcester. And um, uh, a delegate told me today that that uh, she received several phone calls wanting to know why the Eastern Shore delegation supported these new revised uh, regulations. And I just want to make sure that everybody in this room knows that we don't. Um, uh, the the ALR committee. Uh, and, and I'll give you a quick history. 1995, then Governor Clendenin knocked a couple months off the crabbing season. At that time, there were 18 members of the committee. Uh, I think there were nine or 10 from Baltimore County or Baltimore City. There weren't any representation. There was no representation whatsoever by the Eastern, from the Eastern Shore. I complained. Uh, then sec, uh, uh, Speaker of the House, Cass Taylor, and uh, President Senate Mike Miller added four members, two senators and two delegates uh, delegate Addie Eckert and Delegate um, Smeagol became our, our current delegates from the Eastern Shore, and I'm the Eastern Shore Center. You get about a, a packet about that thick every Friday or Saturday, uh, if you get it by mail, uh, of submitted regulations uh, for each week from various agencies across the state. So the ALR, 10 delegates, 10 senators, the original phosphorus management tool regulations, as, as, as Secretary Hans said, were submitted around July 1st as emergency regulations, I immediately sent the regulations to the Maryland Farm Bureau and the Delmarva Poultry Industry, uh, the Eastern Shore delegation, to see what the opinion was. Uh, uh, and uh, vehemently, uh, the, the Delmarva Poultry Industry, the, the Maryland Farm Bureau, as well as the Eastern Shore delegation was opposed to the new emergency regulations, which would have gone in effect uh, about September the 1st. I requested a hearing 
As a member of the committee, every committee member has the right to request a hearing on emergency regulations, as they do during the regular process, which we'll talk about in a second. The, the emergency uh, hearing was, was scheduled for August 28th. Secretary Hans said, uh, with Eastern Shore delegation opposition, um, Senator Mathias talked to Senator Miller, the President of the Senate, and we, we were successful uh, in getting uh, those regulations with, withdrawn, really not withdrawn, but put on hold to revise for further comment. And working with the Delmarva poultry industry, working with the Farm Bureau, uh, you have these new revised regulations. Um, you know, I can't speak for the Maryland Farm Bureau or the Delmarva poultry industry, uh, but, I, but I can tell you that they're not happy with these regulations. Uh, I can tell you the Eastern Shore delegation's not happy with the regulations, but now they have been submitted around the middle of September as regular regulations, which become effective automatically in 90 days. So that means these regulations that you're to comment on tonight will be effective in about 90 days or the middle of December. So. What I plan to do is request another hearing uh, or renew my request for a hearing since you never made it to the August 28th hearing because they, they, were, they were withdrawn and um, uh, have another hearing as, as, as soon as the hearing period. I think you have another briefing in Easton next week and that's your last briefing. And um, what I'll need you to do is write letters of support, support a hearing, and if we are granted a hearing, um, that you're going to have to come to Annapolis and voice your concern and how these uh, um, proposed regulations have put the Delmarva poultry industry out of business. And uh, I think I used every bit of my two minutes that Secretary Hans granted me. Uh, and uh, I, again, I, would, I will need your support to write letters requesting a hearing. And uh, uh, I need you to come to Annapolis to uh, give, give the AAR committee your concerns about these regulations. Thank you. So uh, I hope that was helpful, at least now, those of you in the room that maybe never heard of AELR at least have some understanding of how to. Executive Legislative Review Committee, and that's why they call it AELR. Right. <laughs> and every regulation that's adopted has to go through the AELR process so that the legislators have an opportunity to comment and see those regulations before they go into effect. So at this time, I'm going to call on Royden Powell, Assistant Secretary of Resource Conservation, to talk about, go into a little bit of depth about the tool. Uh, I will uh, tell you all ahead of time, we didn't do the research. I don't know how to do research. We, we completely have confidence in the University of Maryland and, and their research. So uh, I know that some of you in this room tonight have questions about the research. We can't answer those questions. We did not do the research. Uh, we asked the university to have somebody here tonight to discuss the research and answer your questions about the research, and no one could attend. So I just want to <laughs> see we. So uh, Ruin, as I said, is going to go through and talk about the tool, but those <laughs> those of you that uh, have questions about research, I just want to let you know heads up up front. We 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 really can't answer those technical questions about the re specifics of the research. So Ruin. Good evening. My name is Royden Powell. Can you hear me in the back? Very good. Thank you. Uh, just by way of background, the proposal that we're talking about tonight is the phosphorus management tool. This is the next generation of the science about how we assess the risk of phosphorus loss from agricultural landscapes. We've had a tool called the phosphorus site index in place since around the year 2000, and this PMT, as we're going to call it tonight, is the next level of the evolution of that science to enable us to balance the risk between high phosphorus levels, management, and individual site conditions on farms. Just like the phosphorus site index that we're using today, this tool that we're talking about tonight only applies to farm fields where the fertility index value, that's the level of phosphorus in the soil, is 150 or higher. As Buddy said, it's the result of ongoing University of Maryland research, and that those scientists in collaboration with other folks in the region and the nation who are experts in this issue of phosphorus transport have come together to, to refine this tool and moving forward. And generally what this, this science and this research is saying is based on the fact that these soils with very high uh, levels of P in the soil do not show a yield response 
uh, to additional uh, applications of phosphorus. That when those phosphorus levels are at that level, there's sufficient phosphorus available uh, to produce the crops. Just by way of background, the first generation of this P-site index on the left balanced the area of, sort of this high area of high transport with this oval on the right where you had a high level of P. And that area in the middle is the area that we're concerned about. Where those two things coincide is where that risk is highest and where we need to be concerned. The existing P-site index consisted of two parts. Part A looked at the, the, the site, the farm field, the individual characteristics of that field and how likely it was the, the, the soils and, and so forth were going to lend themselves to the loss of phosphorus. On the, the right was part B where you reflected the management that the farmer was going to uh, impart upon that field. How he was going to apply the phosphorus, how much, where it was going to come from, whether it was going to uh, be incorporated, etc. And those two pieces were, at, were multiplied by each other. So that multiplication then tended to average or diminish any one single characteristic that was seen to be high. The second generation of this risk assessment tool, this PMT, looks at basically three areas. These three circles reflect the management. Uh, again, where's the phosphorus coming from? How much is being applied? How, how it's being applied and whether it's being incorporated? The source of that phosphorus, whether it's commercial fertilizer or organic sources, and then site or transport characteristics that are reflected on the individual site. So again, that area in the middle where those three issues converge is that issue of greatest concern. Under the new index, it looks at three, they're called loss pathways. These are the means by which phosphorus can leave the landscape. So it, on the left is the first box, that's called particulate loss, and that's, some, that's related to erosion. Our science that we've based, you know, many decisions for a long time have said if you controlled erosion, you were managing phosphorus. And that's still true today. So it's important that we not lose sight of that and maintain all the progress that we've made with respect to conservation practices and no-till. We don't want to aggravate or go backwards um, and make that particulate loss worse. The second loss, second and third loss pathways relate to what's called dissolved phosphorus. That phosphorus can go essentially into solution when it's in high concentration. And when it's in that dissolved state, it can either run off the surface, which is the middle box, or it can percolate, it can go down into the soil profile, reach groundwater, and then move laterally, which is the third box. So those three pathways and the calculations relate them, related to them are added together. So if any, one, if any one of those boxes is high, any one of those risk uh, loss pathways are high, then that risk, that higher risk, is reflected in that total score. So what you end up having then are these three concentric circles uh, added together for, for all three loss pathways, whether it's the particulate loss, the surface dissolved, or the subsurface dissolved. Under the new phosphorus management tool, there are three risk categories. So under the lowest category, under the lowest risk score, Farmers would be allowed to apply phosphorus at a rate that the crops would utilize it over a three-year period. So you'd look at a three-year planting rotation uh, and what would be utilized over that three-year period and you could apply that amount of phosphorus in that year. The medium, the higher risk category, is you could be allowed to apply what that crop would take up in that one year. So you're, it, that's more limited based on the fact that the risk is higher. And the highest category, just as in the OP site index, when that risk is very is high at the highest level, there's no additional phosphorus that will be applied to those fields. I've give th these next three slides just reflect kind of the, the information that goes into calculating this phosphorus management tool. And I, I put it up here just to really illustrate it, that it's the same type of information that's going into the P site index today. So we're looking at the distance of the farm field to surface water, whether or not there are any buffers in place between the cropland and surface water, the, the level of phosphorus in the soil, we call that the soil P, uh, FIV level, and then an indication of erosion, this 
Russell 2, the sediment loss factor, is a calculation based on the soil type and the slope, distance, et cetera, to indicate the number of tons of soil that would be lost per year on that site. Those factors together are calculated to determine what's in that first box that we talked about, the particulate loss. The second box is calculated using, again, information about how much phosphorus is to be applied, where it's coming from, how it's being applied, and whether or not it's incorporated or injected, for example. There's a new factor called the degree of phosphorus saturation, and that's a, that comes from your soil test, and it's an indication of the amount of phosphorus that's in that soil sample relative to the iron and aluminum. So it's an indication of how much of that phosphorus is bonded up um, through those chemical, those ionic attractions. Again, you'll see distance to surface water, the buffers, and then soil characteristics such as permeability and slope. Those factors go into calculating that middle box that we refer to as surface loss. Then finally, the subsurface loss is calculated where you have artificial drainage. So in a constructed drainage situation, for example, uh, you're, you're also looking and adding that risk into this calculation. So again, you're looking at how much phosphorus is being applied, where it's coming from, again, how it's being applied, the degree of phosphorus saturation goes into that calculation, as well as other soil characteristics such as their drainage class and hydrologic soil group. So these are generally pieces of information that people writing your plans today uh, are already using for the most part in calculating your phosphorus site index. This slide is intended to reflect the, the fundamental differences, the basic differences between the old PSI and the new PMT. The old PSI had four risk categories that ranged from low to very high. At the lowest category under the old tool, you were allowed to do nitrogen-based planning. Um, the old index used uh, a score or a weighting for priority watersheds, which does not exist in the, in the new tool. The new tool is generally designed to be much more site-specific, taking into consideration the individual characteristics of each field and calculating that risk on a farm-by-farm -farm field basis. The new PMT has three risk, risk categories, as I've described. At each level, there's some level, as you saw, some level of phosphorus management that's required when that soil FIV is over 150. Something that's new, as I say, is this degree of phosphorus saturation, and that's, again, a measure that comes from your soil test. That's a quick overview of the new tool and giving you an idea of how it's different from the existing phosphorus site index. I think what we wanted to do at this point would be to try to answer questions that you might have. We wanted to... Hmm? Changes. Changes, yes. As part of the process, when we pulled the proposal from AELR, we went back had a small stakeholder group that came together and developed a, what we're calling a revised proposal. Okay. All right. With this small group of stakeholders, we had Maryland Farm Bureau in the room, Delmarva Poultry Industry, and Maryland Grain Producers Association. In addition, we also had environmental interests represented by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation, and there was one individual who represented a, a coalition of about 16 organizations, and they called themselves the Maryland Clean Agricultural Coalition. So with those five people in the room, we crafted a revised proposal um, after two meetings. So what I want to run through this, and I think this forms the basis of this consensus that we reached about how the department would move forward to implement the new phosphorus management tool. Generally, based on the concerns that we heard, people need more time. People want to understand the impact of this proposal better before it becomes a regulatory requirement. So given that fundamental issue and concern, we've pr we're proposing a phased-in schedule to implement the new tool. Between now and September, the end of September of next year, 2014, Nutrient management plans would be developed using both the existing phosphorus site index and the new phosphorus management tool. 
they would continue to operate their farms using the old PSI, and they would get information from the calculation of the new tool to understand how, how this new tool would affect them when it, was, when it was to be implemented. This information would then help farmers plan for any adjustments that they would need to make in their operation. In addition, MDA would, is proposing to gather information from running these two tools so that we have an understanding of that impact and can make the necessary changes to programs that we need to make to give you the resources to get this job done. So whether that's, for example, more resources, more funding for a manure transport program, understanding the additional amount of manure required to be transported is going to be coming to us as a result of this phased in process and the information that MDA would be gathering. So farmers get more information to understand how it affects them. We get more information on the state side to be able to position resources to help uh, provide an effective implementation. On or after October 1st of 2014, plans would be then developed using the phosphorus management tool. And those plans that are then implemented beginning January 1, basically crop year 2015, would be implemented using the new tool. And that is without regard to when the plan was written. So we've got this phase in period where both tools are run, you get information, we get information, and then for crop year 15, then the new tool would be implemented um, for regardless of when the plan's written. Through our discussions with the stakeholder, we agreed to provide a public outreach campaign. And there are two prongs to this, this campaign. The first is targeted to the public because we believe that there's value in helping the public understand the benefits of stockpiling poultry litter, for example, and proper timing of application. Basically saying that a, a stockpile of litter, stockpiled correctly in the right place is a good thing because you're holding that material and waiting to apply it in the spring generally when you're about to plant the crop and the crop can utilize that. So we want people to understand that A, that that's a sound practice and B, that it occurs according to a regulation, that there are process, that there's rules that relate to where that material can be stockpiled and how and so forth. So it's not, it is subject to the state's control, if you will. The second prong of the campaign is targeted to the farm community. And that outreach is really aimed at those farmers who today are not using poultry litter or organic sources as a source of crop nutrients. That based on the value that exists for these materials, these are highly sought after materials and they have value. And it goes beyond the N, P, and K that's in that litter. It could be the organic matter that helps improve soil health. It could be the micronutrients that provide other benefits for crop production. But generally, these materials are good to use and it improves productivity. So we want to promote the use of these materials as a means by which to redistribute those excess manures where those situations occur. Back when the Water Quality Improvement Act was first passed, we had a pilot poultry litter manure transport or poultry litter transport program. That evolved into the program that we have today that assists in the transportation of animal manures of all types to farms that can use it. At the same time, we also instituted back then what we called a manure matching service. So if you as an operator had more litter than you could use, you would simply register on this exchange. It was a website exchange. It was publicly available. And then your name is then available to someone else who wants to use it, who is also going to register. So it, it, it's simply a means by which to connect those people that want to use it with those people uh, that have it available. So we're, gonna, we're revitalizing that. We've gotten a new eight, actually it's an 855 number now, but it, the concept is just to revitalize, re-energize our efforts to connect um, these two, two entities. In situations where 
in, in our discussions, there were concerns from poultry growers that, well, what if I have to clean out my house and there's no one available to take my litter? On the day I need to move it, there's no home for it. So out of that concern grew a commitment where the state would identify a state-owned and operated facility that could act as a, a temporary receiving uh, station, if you will, where that, to give that litter a home. From that site, that, that litter would then be redistributed to other places in the state that could use it appropriately. The, the point is that it's a, it's a stopgap measure, it's a last ditch effort, but in any case, that grower would not be prevented from cleaning out the house and receiving the next flock of birds. I talked about the uh, information that was going to come forward out of this during this interim period. We would evaluate uh, the impacts of that implementation. We were going to collect the information from these plans and identify the additional resources that, that may be necessary. Additionally, we think that there's value in continuing this conversation with a key group of folks, whether you call it a troubleshooter team, an implementation team, whatever, people that are on the ground and have a direct impact or role uh, in implementing these things so that we can have first-hand conversation with those folks to identify challenges that, that may occur. Um, we'll meet regularly to, to come up with solutions, but the idea being that this is going to be an ongoing conversation so that we make sure we understand the issues that we hadn't, cons hadn't thought of or things that may pop up that need to be addressed. Process-wise, um, our next step is to publish the proposal in the Maryland Register uh, on the 18th of October. So that is on schedule to occur, and with that is provided a 30-day comment period. So as Senator Colborn outlined, you know, when that opportunity presents itself, that is the formal comment period uh, for this proposal. Our intention tonight was to provide you information and enable you to ask questions so that you're clear on what we're proposing and that when that comment period opens, you're better positioned to, to make comments uh, <coughs> through the process. That brings me back to where I started. So we're at that point then to answer, uh, respond to questions. Um, what I'd like to do as we go forward I've got, there's a couple folks in the room that are, have microphones. Howard's in the back. If someone wants to grab this one, this one does, might provide some value. What I'd like you to do is I'm going to try to recognize you in order. I'm going to ask you to uh, just tell us who you are and where you're from uh, in asking that question. Folks, there are a lot of, there are a lot of folks here tonight that, and we want to make sure we give every the opportunity to ask the questions that they want to ask and make the comments that they that they want to so I ask you just simply thank you I ask you just to be respectful of everybody's time and, and we're going to go through this I've got the first gentleman in the back and then delegate McDermott will be next no You hear me now? I can hear you now. All right. You said you're going to implement Your name, this. please. Uh, my name's Thomas. We'll leave the last name out because I don't want y'all showing up my form tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, you said you're going to implement this or submit it the 18th of October, right? It'll be published on the 18th of October, yes. So sometime between now and then, you're going to meet with farmers to discuss the pros and cons of it? You just said you were. That's part of what we're doing tonight in terms of providing information. Recognize that as the secretary explained, this has been an ongoing process that we started last December. So the opportunity to provide comment and have conversation has sort of been ongoing. So tonight is part of that in terms of providing information. The formal comment period where folks that are, have comments to make will be between that October 18th and October, or November 19th period. That doesn't help with you changing up the rules and regulations before you've published them though. That seems like something you should do before you publish it. That's part of the process? I'm because, well, I mean, I understand your question. 
you guys are up there in charge. You're supposed to ask us before you go doing this kind of stuff. We published that back in January as part of the process. Understandable. We got comments. We got a total of eight. We republished based on that technical requirement that we faced. Now we're back into the process, and it's an ongoing process. So in that comment period, if there's things that we think need to be changed, if there's substantive changes we think are appropriate, that can be reflective, and we simply go back through the process again. Understandable. But in the same time, I just don't get why we're the ones being picked on. I mean, you all implemented it four years ago. You started the cover crop program, which is great. Everybody here loves it. But at the same time, three years ago, you implemented a law where sewage treatment plants don't have to report under 100,000 gallons of sewage spill. So why are we being picked on and nothing of theirs has to be reported? It seems uh, like the farmer's the little guy here. I can't respond to that MDE regulation. What I can say is MDEs in the process of updating their regulations to make the sludge management more consistent with the MDA regulations. So there'll be less of a double standard once these MDE changes are put into effect. All right. And my last one is you were talking about the University of Maryland. I was speaking with a gentleman less than a month ago at the university. They are actually using our own chicken litter for turf grass to see how good it works on the western shore. He had no recollection of anything going on there showing how the eastern shore is phosphorus using against chicken manure. Now there's nobody here from their department tonight to stand up for him, but I just don't understand how the gentleman that runs the turf grass department is using litter to better land and we're being blamed for making it worse. I think what we're proposing is how do we do the best job possible in assessing the risk of high phosphorus levels and environmental impact. So that evolution of science, as I say, is something that's been ongoing for a number of years. Uh, and if we have technical questions about that science, we'd be glad to refer those to the university. Thank you. Delegate McDermott. Secretary, thank you for uh, the meeting tonight in, in response to uh, Senator Colburn's uh, work in the ALR. Let me just ask you this. I, you know, the, uh, it's, it is difficult, I must say, to come to a meeting of the Department of Agriculture that really could be a meeting of the Maryland Department of the Environment. And when those two types of groups have meetings that I can't distinguish which one is which, I know that I'm already in trouble. And I know that 52 years ago, when your department was formed, it was formed so that the farmers would be able to have the benefit of a voice that's very close in the General Assembly, uh, to sit at that table and to have that voice. So what I want to ask you tonight is, I saw the science, and we're told that science is evolving. I hear it's the Maryland Department of the Environment working with the Maryland Department of Ag. I see it's a university doing the research. I don't see any factor up there at all tonight that deals with the economic value or the subsequent economic loss, not only to the shore, but to the state of Maryland. And I don't see those numbers projected. I see about the, the P numbers. I see what it means when we apply. I see what it means when we don't. I know about the land that's going to come out of line if you implement this. But I do not see anybody, I don't see a Department of Economics doing a study about how this is going to impact our families. I don't see a study from the state of Maryland saying this is what it's going to mean to us as a state government. This is how many millions or billions of dollars we're going to lose in loss. And until we start seeing those types of numbers projected up on that board, how in the world do we implement something that could be so catastrophic and the only thing we're concerned about is what a P number was three years ago as to what it is today and not what the families that are providing, not only for us to eat, but for their own sakes. How is that number not reflected in the study like this, Mr. Secretary? And you are the one, you are the one assigned with that task of making sure the farmers have a seat at that table and that the governor hears them. And I would like to know that tonight, and I'm sure many families here would like to know that tonight. Where's the 
Well, we surely recognize that agriculture is the number one industry in the state, and everybody clearly understands that poultry is the foundation for agriculture in the state of Maryland. All, the grain that we grow in this state all comes to the poultry industry. I believe what we have before us now is an issue of re modern research, making changes to the way we operate our farms, which is something that's been happening for a period of years. And as far as economic impact, there's been a lot of questions about what's the economic impact of this. Well, as Wooden said, until we have the data that's run, when we run these two tools comparatively for a year, uh, no one's really certain of what the economic impact of that is. We clearly recognize that litter is going to have to move. Uh, we clearly recognize that litter has a value, has a as an excellent nutrient source for crops across the entire state. As the gentleman said at the university, they're doing research with litter, how it grows wonderful turf. Nobody disputes that. Uh, it's a wonderful source of nutrients to grow crops. What we have in the state is a distribution problem where over a long period of time, there was applications made based on the current research. Uh, that at that time, farmers did what they thought was best based on the research that was up to date at that time, uh, but as research has evolved and things have come into place, uh, changes have to be made, and nobody likes changes. Uh, we certainly are here in a state, we're the epicenter of the Chesapeake Bay. The Ch Chesapeake Bay is a world-watched estuary, not just a state or a national watch. We are watched by the entire world of what we do here. And we always hear about how why are we picked on? Why is Maryland picked on? Well, EPA holds Maryland to a different standard than the other states because of our relativity to the location of the Chesapeake Bay. The things that we do have the quickest and the most impact to the main stem of the Chesapeake Bay. So we don't take lightly the impacts of these things that we do. And there are certainly others out here that would like to do a lot more and have not done that. Uh, we certainly have not seen the worst of things that could happen. But what we're trying to do is work through using current research, look at the issues as they arise, uh, and make sure and try to protect the poultry producers themselves to make sure that when it comes time to move manure, there's an opportunity to move that manure and a place for it to go. You know, there's nobody here is saying that litter is a bad thing. We have never said litter is a bad thing. Litter is a good thing. We have plenty of land in this state I mentioned earlier. We have 1.2 million acres of cropland in the state of Maryland. We only need about 150,000 acres of corn based on the amount of litter that we produce to take that litter environmentally safe and economically viable. That's not, you know, we have those available acres. We just have to change our distribution system. And we have committed to do everything in our power to address all those issues and concerns that come up once this tool is implemented. Uh, it's, it's, it's utmost importance to us to make sure that no poultry grower is harmed in this. And we're going to do everything that we can to minimize those impacts to the greatest extent possible. And we are all fully committed to that. Uh, but we cannot turn our backs on research. As, as Delegate McDermott knows, uh, sewage treatment plants are being asked to do more. The state has spent hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars updating sewage treatment plants. Yes, they do have overflows on occasion because of events. But they are certainly in a much better place today than they were many, many years ago. So every, we are not the only ones here. If you think we're the only ones here, you should ask Delegate McDermott about the other laws that have been passed in the state and the other regulations that have been passed on the different sectors and what they're being asked to do. So it's not just us. Everyone is being asked. But I know that you feel like you're the only one being asked to do anything, and that is not true. We are all being asked. My name is Virgil Shockley. I'm a Worcester County Commissioner. Um, It's rough standing up there, buddy, okay? I just want to say I know that. I know what it's like to be in a room full of 300, 400 people, especially at budget time, and people want certain things, 
and they don't quite understand what's going on. Um, but I do want to make a couple comments. First off, uh, Mr. Powell made a comment about phosphorus, and I, I tried to get it written down as fast as I could, but you do talk fast. Uh, but I got most of it, I think, and what you said was when levels of phosphorus are high, the plant doesn't need any more phosphorus to produce a crop. I think that was the gist of what you said. Um, and I know we don't have a university here tonight, and I'm sorry to hear that, but that is absolutely wrong. And my crop guy is standing right, sitting right over there. That's Jeff. We had a corn field where the corn was this high, then 10 feet, 20 feet later, it was this high. Two foot, then four foot. So we did what we should do. We took a tissue sample. And lo and behold, a field that ranked 320 in phosphorus came back low in phosphorus. Just because it's high in phosphorus doesn't mean the plant can take it up. The basic reason that you have the problem is for 50 years, most of the people in the room used 10-10-10 fertilizer because that's how they got their nitrogen. Unfortunately, at the time, science was way behind and we put 100 pounds of phosphorus on at the same time we put 100 pounds of nitrogen in order to grow our corn crop. And it's going to take another 50 years before we correct it. But I want to echo what McDermott said here, Delegate McDermott. In Worcester County, my district, and Senator Mathias's district, and, and Mike's district, in my little district, in District 4, there's about 11 million chickens on any given day. And it's a very easy economic equation to, to, to get to. I have 45,000 chickens. I don't mind telling anybody, last year we made about $90,000. So if you double the capacity of your chickens, that's about the money you're going to end up getting. That's what we've been running for the last four or five years. I've got 11 million chickens. That's about $22 million to Worcester County. That's just the poultry. Forget the grain, forget the corn, forget anything else. You add that in, you're looking at another $20 million on top of that. Wacomico, ag is first. Where's Lee at? Ag is first, right? Okay. Dorchester, Somerset, the same way. Rough total, I figured you're looking at about a $120 million impact. Now, yeah, we got to do certain things, but at some point in time, somebody has to stand there and be reasonable about how we do it. And you can't just jump on board a ship and say, we're going to sail to that destination. It doesn't matter who's saying we're going to sail to that destination. And I appreciate the fact, I really do, because it's nice to be first on a lot of things. But sure as hell isn't nice to be first when you're in the state of Maryland when you're getting regulations pushed down your throat that other states don't have. It's that plain and simple. And it's hard for everybody to understand why we are, quote, being punished. Because I hear it every day. Jim hears it every day. Mike hears it every day. And I guess part of the equation needs to be that somebody has to come up with the economic impact. And the other thing I will say, because there are a lot of people who want to say something, is this. I've got soil samples that go back 20 years. Brooks is in the room somewhere and he'll, vou he'll vouch me on this. In a drought year, when you put down, if you're trying to grow 150 bushel corn, you're putting down 150 pounds of nitrogen. You put down whatever you put down phosphorus-wise on manure. That corn crop doesn't take it up in a drought year. So when you take that soil sample in October, you're going to get a high number versus a year that has rain. The question I really wanted to ask the University of Maryland tonight was when did they take the soil samples when they first did their initial report? Was it 2009, 2010 in a drought year? Because that has a huge impact on everything. And to answer your question on the new site phosphorus index, soil samples, by the way, go to a and Lab in Virginia. Very interesting little statistic, a and Lab. Only in the state of Maryland do they actually make a, a parentheses and put Maryland statistics on there. There's a phosphorus number, and beside it, they print Maryland and Maryland's number, which is always running 10 to 15% higher than the actual number of phosphorus. And a and basically says, because there's a state law in Maryland that says that's the formula we have to use. So in 49 other states, whatever the soil sample is in phosphorus, it's that number, but only in Maryland is it 10 to 15% higher depending on what it is. I've never heard of that before. 
Actually, I didn't even realize it existed until the other day when I actually looked at it one more time when I was reading my soil test and my, my nutrient management plan. Why are we higher? That's a good question. I think I can answer that. We'll see. Uh, I think there were two questions in there, at least, that I recall, and I'll try. We, we, we continue, and we have heard several examples, as Commissioner Shockley says, where uh, I have high P levels, and my crop is showing a P deficiency. Uh, just yesterday, we emailed Dr. McGrath again to reiterate what he had been telling us before, uh, and his comment is that uh, he can't say that that would never happen, but in most cases, there's something else going on that that plant can't take up that phosphorus. So I guess what we would ask you to do is, uh, when you have those cases, please notify Dr. McGrath or notify him, and we'll let him get out there because we want to know what's going on. And his... His research is based on 10 years of soil samples, so they didn't go out and just pick, you know, 8, 8, 08, 09, 010 and pull some soil samples and run their process. This, is, this was ongoing, which means every year they're out there doing those things. The reason that Maryland has a different number is just because they use a different system. It's like uh, the speed limit is 55 and it's different in kilometers and different in miles per hour. The, the level of P should be the same. It's just the formula we use comes up with a different number. Why? It's just the system that the university developed and it's the one that we use and every lab uses a different system for evaluating phosphorus. But your levels should be, the, the amount of phosphorus if it was in a jar should be the same even though there may be a different number because you're using Again, back when we started nutrient management uh, after the Water Quality Improvement Act, we contacted all the labs, there were basically seven labs operating, serving Maryland farmers. There was a, con because the labs each use a different, it's called an extraction process. It's how you assess, how you take that sample and measure the amount of phosphorus in it. There are different chemical processes that they use to do that analytical analysis. And there's a resulting number that comes out of those various processes. We wanted to be able to convert that back to a standard plane, if you will, a common denominator across all those labs. So to get back to that Maryland for FIV value, there's a conversion factor that's used to apply to each lab's result that bring it back to that standard number across all the labs so that, in essence, all those soil samples are being measured using the same yardstick at the end of the day. They're, they're expressing a number that's the same, regardless of the lab that's used. So the a &L number is X, and then this conversion after this multiplier is applied is Y. And that Y is gonna be the same resulting number regardless of the lab. <laughs> it's like a Delegate Otto. know that we've been on top of this. I asked you in February at the Eastern Shore delegation. Charles Otto, Somerset County Delegate, 38A. We had an Eastern Shore delegation in February the 8th. And I missed the meeting that this uh, phosphorus index was presented to the Nutrient Management Committee. I think that was in December, may have been November. But uh, I've been on it representing the grain producer for a number of years. And I just cease to get notice of them anymore, I guess. But uh, my fellow delegate Jacobs in, uh, in Kent County is on that as representing the Maryland House of Delegates. And he showed me the information about this phosphorus uh, index revisions. And uh, at that time, you committed in February to give me a list of who's on that committee and uh, follow up with me. And I also asked the secretary who it was going to impact. And you conceded at that time it was going to more severely impact the lower eastern shore than the rest, possibly some in central Maryland because of dairy production. But I still don't have those answers of who it's going to impact and how much. Delegate Otto, that's my fault for not responding to that specific question about the membership. So I apologize for not getting you that information. I, that information will be forthcoming. I think as we've talked about, we're 
in a mode in this phase-in period to gather that information and better understand the impact. We know generally where those impacts are based on the changes that we're seeing in the tool. We're putting additional resources in programs like the manure transport program, anticipating those needs, and we're committing to track that process with the uh, troubleshooting team, implementation team, to continue to monitor that process going forward. Is it not true in that December or November meeting that it's indicated, the university indicated that probably 80% of the crop land would be impacted and wouldn't let, be allowed to put any more phosphorus on in the lower shore counties? They, they had done an analysis of 400 sites statewide, 129 of which were on the lower eastern shore. So in those 129 samples taken on the Lower Eastern Shore. And this is the extent of the science that's been done on this project. Isn't this it? was an assessment of this new tool relative to the old tool. It's, it's simply that. It's simply a comparison between the results of farms operated under the P-Site index. that's the extent of this science other than having other people review it. That's a, that was an effort to understand the differences between how this new tool would affect farmers relative to the old tool. So it was in that analysis that 82% of those 129 samples on the Lower Eastern Shore landed in the high category and would not be applying additional phosphorus. And did not this revision, we didn't know until the comment period ended February 25th that you say we didn't comment but eight people in the state. We didn't know what the phosphorus tool was going to do to us, did we? That it information was, uh, was available at that time. No, June the 28th you indicated it was revised of this year. So in, on February 25th, we didn't know what the phosphorus tool was going to really do to us. To be clear, the revision that was the final document that came forward on June 28th from the university had a technical change to it that did not substantially change how the tool worked or the resulting score. Well, I think it changed uh, from four categories to three, so it increased at about 30 percent the number of people that were going to be disqualified of using phosphorus on their land. The, the change from four categories to three categories was part of the original proposal first submitted to AELR in December of 2012. So AELR saw this in 2012? It was first submitted to AELR on December 18, 2012. So what's the use of the Nutrient Management Advisory Committee at the Department of Ag? I thought we had a purpose that the governor established. That, that committee is an advisory committee. It did meet. It, the, Dr. McGrath and Dr. Cole presented the findings and the proposal related to the phosphorus management tool in addition to the resulting um, information of the analysis that I described. It was based on that presentation the department moved forward with the proposal. So we're important about process now going through AELR and this, that, and the other. The process has become important, but I'd have thought the Nutrient Management Advisory Committee would have had a part in the process and input would have been taken. I believe that they did have a part in the process. Also, we went through this process about this time last year, about the same kind of function, I think, uh, it was up in Easton. And uh, I hope you're... Your hearing aids are open tonight, and uh, I wish you well. I think you need to hear from these folks and not me anymore. This gentleman right back here in the hat. Are you no, sir. <laughs> I know better. My name is Larry Limbeck. I live in Palville right now. Uh, I do have a question. My wife and I are currently purchasing a farm here in Wicomico County. We intend to close on that. <laughs> within the next few months. And I'd like to know how that's going to impact our decision to purchase a poultry farm. And um, I have a couple other questions after your answer. Generally, as we move forward with this proposal, we've recognized that there are impacts and we've considered those impacts and planned resources to be available to address those impacts. We're, I think we're, with the phased in approach, it's on the table now. We're gonna have better information. Um, to make those decisions and investments. You're gonna have better information to understand that, but our intention is to, we recognize the value of the poultry industry in the state and are committed to maintaining that. So we're continuing to put those resources in place. Just two questions relating what you uh, mentioned tonight. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the transport program will be in place to help out the farmers. What 
fees, if any, will be uh, associated with that that uh, the, the poultry farmers will be responsible for? I'm sorry, was that, what fees? Yes, sir. There are no fees related to that. The transport program is designed to offset the cost of transportation. So the entity, uh, whether it's the sending farm or the receiving farm that's going to propose to transport that, makes application to the department. Uh, that's a, upon approval that transportation occurs and there's a reimbursement that takes place based on the volume of litter that's moved and how far it's moved. We, the department does not get involved in the transaction, you know, establishing the cost between the buyer and the seller. All we're doing is offsetting transportation cost based on scale tickets. I'm sure that uh, the representatives of the Department of Agriculture here tonight are aware that uh, many times the poultry farmers have a deal with local crop growers where a crop grower will either perform or pay for the crust out or the clean out of the poultry houses. Mm -hmm. If this is put into place, how's that going to affect those deals if those farmers are no longer allowed to use our poultry litter? Whether those farms can use it or whether other farms can use it, that's still a service that they can provide. But most importantly, that litter still has value based on the crop nutrients that are in it, the organic matter and the micronutrients. So those, those markets, I believe, will be sustained based on the value of that litter going forward. I just have a few, uh, few comments regarding uh, this legislation that's been proposed and its implementation. Um, as we uh, get going, I just want to say quickly thank you for coming here and allowing us to ask questions and to voice our opinion. Um, I do appreciate that. I think every one of us does appreciate that as well. I think it's very important that you pay attention to what we say uh, because we don't get up in the morning and go fly around in a little red helicopter and take pictures of people's farms. We don't put on lab coats, most of us, and go do tests in, uh, in a university somewhere. And uh, we don't sit behind a desk somewhere and read other people's reports. The people that are here in this room tonight are vested and invested in our land in a much more intimate way. When we get up in the morning and we go out there and we work in our land, we're working on what we own. That's what puts the food on our table. That's what provides for the health care for my wife and my two-year-old son. And someday my farm is going to be my two-year-old son's farm when he grows up. So it's my future, it's my present, and it's my son's future. When I was nine years old, my father, who's sitting right here behind me, bought a poultry farm because he wanted to teach me responsibility and a good work ethic. He wanted to teach me how to be responsible with my time and with my resources and how to manage those properly. And those are the kind of things that I want to instill in my son as I go out and I purchase a farm and I raise my son on that farm. We're the ones who are tilling the land. We're the ones who are in those chicken houses producing the grain and the chicken that feed all of us and all of you. We're the ones who are out on the water fishing, we're in the woods hunting, and we're the ones who actually see how our land is impacted, not from a little red helicopter with a camera in it, and not from behind a desk reading somebody's report, and not some scientist in a lab coat who couldn't even bother to come out here and talk to us tonight. We're out there seeing the effects every single day when we get up. So I submit to you that if you would like to ask the experts in the field, that these are the experts in the field. I'd like to read something from the state website very quickly. Um, in my pursuit of purchasing a farm, I found this and uh, it made me uh, briefly forget some of the regulations and things that are shoved down our throats. This is on the, uh, in regards to the background of the agricultural transfer tax and some of the waivers that are issued for agricultural land. The preservation of agricultural land is extremely important to all citizens of Maryland. Years ago, the Maryland General Assembly declared 
that it is in the general public interest of the state to foster and encourage farming activities to maintain a readily available source of food and dairy products, to encourage the preservation of open space as an amenity necessary for human welfare and happiness, and it goes on. And it is clear that our state has at one time, if not now, genuinely recognized what agriculture has to do with our economy and with our well-being. And I find it very disturbing that we make statements like that on our website and then we go on to make regulations and legislation that literally <coughs> destroys economic prosperity. And that continues to go on. It's a problem that is not restricted to the state of Maryland. It's all over the United States of America. And we're talking about the EPA, that's a whole nother story, but boy, could I go on about that. In closing, I'd just like to remind everyone here, and especially you guys, that it wasn't too long ago when a group of men decided that the regulations being imposed on them were too great and that they needed to leave those regulations. Those men wrote a document where they described the reasons that they believed they needed to leave their country. And they called it the Declaration of Independence. And they stated in that document that they had a few rights that they considered that to come from God. They couldn't be taken away by any man. Among those was that were mentioned with life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What a lot of people don't know if they don't study history closely is that one of the uh, terms, the pursuit of happiness, was originally discussed in the wording, the pursuit of property. And those men knew that for true freedom to abound, that individuals needed to have the right to own and to use their property in the way that they felt best, in the way that they felt their God led them to use their lives and their property. I think we've forgotten that in this country. We've forgotten what human capital is. We've forgotten what individual liberty is. Socialism's never worked. Fascism's never worked. Centralized planning often has extremely harmful effects to the population and to the individual. This country was founded on the rights of the individual. And I think it's very important for people who make centralized plans or rules or regulations or legislations to remember the individual because these men and women and the families that they represent here today are about to have some extremely large impacts placed on them. And when you put legislation like this into place, I appreciate that you realize that those impacts will be here and that you've taken some steps to make sure that we're protected in some minor ways. But when it comes down to it, you're enacting legislation or proposing to elect, enact legislation that requires you to enact more legislation to protect us from the legislation that you just passed. There was uh, one of the most famous politicians of recent time said that government is not the answer to the problem. The government is the problem. And I think we need to take a step back and look at the lives that are going to be impacted by the problem and see what the problem really is here. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. <laughs> Mr. Donahue. My name is Shelton Donahue. I'm a farmer on the west side of Wasomico County. We're talking tonight. I've got a couple of comments to make on the basic premise here. Can you hear me now? Yeah, That's good. better. Some of these regulations are at the instigation of a group many of you know called senior scientists. A lot of you know who most of those people are. I consider myself a senior scientist. I've got more college training in some of these areas than most of those senior scientists have. I'm sure the 
specific people at the University of Maryland are not necessarily the people I'm referring to. I do have a question about us working on their findings without learning what the University of Delaware is coming up with on their search for the source of this phosphorus. I remember sitting in a meeting with Dr. Staver one morning a few years ago before cover crops when they first discovered that we could have water-soluble phosphorus. That was the end of us controlling erosion to control <coughs> phosphorus. Uh, I was in a committee with uh, Wayne Gilchrist. At the end of his presentation, I asked him how much phosphorus we were talking about. He says, probably as much as a pound or a pound and a half per acre. I said, Dr. Staver, we're putting on 150, 200 pounds per acre. We've been told it stays there. But if we lose a pound of it or a pound and a half of it, how significant is that from an economic standpoint? I point out these new regulations have to do with a model that is supposed to evaluate the potential risk of phosphorus leaving that soil. There's not a, not a bit of information here that shows how much phosphorus does leave my farm. It's all a paper calculation. Yeah. I've got a lot of experience with farming too. I've used a lot of manure. We spend all this money and cause the economic hardship on all of the farmers that we're talking about. We're going to get that manure used to move to another farm. And if he uses it at his permitted level under his Maryland Nutrient Management Plan, you'll have one year or maybe two years that he can use manure, and then his farm will be the same shape mine is. You'll have to find somebody somewhere else to send it. So you're spinning your wheels on that one. Delic Dermot talked about the economics to the farmer. There's been no economic analysis done on this program. There never is in the environmental programs in the state of Maryland. <coughs> the only one I've ever heard was that we can put regulations on farmers a whole lot less money than we can put those tighter regulations on governments and sewer plants and that type thing. I said, I haven't seen the numbers. Is the cost of the farmer included in that number? Oh, no, this is just the cost to the government. So you're saving a hell of a lot of money, but you're not taking into consideration what it's costing me. This past year, I was allowed use three tons per acre of manure on uh, 160 acres of corn. I've been told that after this coming year, I will no longer be able to use any manure. So thinking about the economics, I ran some numbers. I bought nitrogen and potash this past year from one of the fellows sitting in this room charge me too much money, but I'm going to use his numbers anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I calculated, based on the numbers from my current nutrient management plan, the analysis of the three tons per acre of manure I used, and it cost me on this year's prices $68 per acre to replace the hundred and two pounds of available nitrogen per acre, and it cost me $61.30 to replace the 128 pounds of potash for a total of $129.30 per acre. On irrigated land, I made about 200 bushels per acre, just slightly over 200, but rounded off to 200 bushels per acre. That difference, if I had bought the commercial fertilizer this year to replace all the manure, would cost me 62 cents a bushel. On a 125 bushel yield, 
in non-irrigated land, it would have cost me a dollar and three cents per bushel. That total on my little 160 acres, which is cutting back next year to 100 acres, and next year it's probably going to cut back lower than that, would have been $20,688. Now this year, if I made about $40,000, and I'm going to drop about 20 of that in extra fertilizer costs next year, and at the same time, today the price of corn south of 450 and still going down, I don't know how much money you guys expect me to make. I don't think you're evaluating it right. Howard, you got one in the back? Yeah. I'm Blair Ranneberger. I'm from, uh, I'm a farmer in Wicomico County. I'm a board of director of Farm Bureau in Wicomico County, and I'm a board director of DPI, and the reason why I mention this Last January, February, you got seven to 10 comments. Two of those comments came from two organizations of which Buddy used to be president of. You also are an honorary member of our DPI board of directors. Roy, you come to our environmental committee, our grower committee. Both those organa organizations represented 45,000 people. And because those two comments just count as two comments, that's why you're here again today. Number two, it took a couple years to get the cover crop program going, and it is a success today. But you're asking all this stuff to be implemented in a year and a half. How you're going to educate the Kennedy Guy, Water Keepers Alliance, and all the other all the environmental groups with a proper stockpile is good luck all we're going to have is more lawsuits one more to add go ahead and go about another 10 miles and go into delaware that administration under markel said we we're going to grow agriculture that's a whole different world as soon as you cross that line where were you where was mde back in 2009 2010 you put your hands behind your back. Ed Key created a win-win situation, and that's why agriculture is growing today. I got one right up here, and then I've got one in the front. Yes. Is that Eddie? Yeah. All right. It's a book uh, that I wrote, so I know it's right. <laughs> Poultry litter management with GPS and the phosphorus index. That was 2001 that inter uh, research was done. None of this research was in what the University of Maryland did. There's over 2,000 soil tests represented here. They used 129. Go to page 42, and you'll see that the average acreage there was 62 acres out of 218 that are low in phosphorus. What the University of Maryland needs to do is find a different soil test that tells the amount of phosphorus in the soil that is available for plant growth. That's what we need. The greatest challenge of today is to feed 9 billion or more people. This is from uh, DuPont, president of. The effort has to be collaborative, requiring assistance from governments, business non-government organizations as well as those who can leverage global resources and science to help create solutions science has to become the local wisdom solutions have to be sustainable the world will look to u.s agriculture in maryland to lead the way america's farmers will need to continue to improve productivity management practices by deploying science that takes yield to the next level without mortally taxing the earth and its resources our current nutrient management is on a road to down yield our crops. We keep putting on less and less and less. And we use three out of five years for our targets and we're going less and less and less. And you're, you're telling us now that we got to put on even less fertilizer than what we used three years ago. It takes 12 years for a drop of water to go 150 feet from the watershed over here at Green Branch. 
All right, what we're measuring now in the bay occurred 12 years ago, which is the advent of the spinner spreader. It's not the one that we used to throw it up in the air and drive out from under. These are actually spreaders that can be calibrated. So give science time. Don't give us more regulation. We need time. Time is on our side, I hope. Thank you. Ms. Chesnick. Good evening, Royden, Census Secretary Hans. My main concern here tonight, and we all have concerns, the economic ones I think people have already addressed, I am a no-land poultry farmer. What a no-land poultry farmer is, it's us bunch of folks who have chicken houses and no way to dispose of the manure unless it goes through Maryland Manure Transport or it goes to a neighboring farmer. The biggest problem is that manure transport is not reliable. I needed manure transport money in September. There was none to be had. I had to take my litter and actually find a local farmer who his farm under these new regulations will no longer be able to take it. Um, the vast majority of farms in these three lower counties anymore are no land. And that creates a massive problem. We're not only no land, we're CAFOs. So we can't stack manure outside for more than, I believe, 14 days if we have to. Manure transport money is either A, not there, or B, and this is a question I have for you, what happens to folks who are now sending their litter to local farmers who grow for a non-participating integrator? If your integrator does not put money into the manure transport fund, you currently cannot move litter with transport money. Is that going to change? That requirement is correct as you've described it. For an individual to participate, for a grower to participate, the company for which they grow chickens needs to be a participating company in the program. So today, three of the five companies have agreements established. The fourth, there's a fourth company that's had not participated in the past that is developing an agreement today and there is a fifth company that we've entertaining a dialogue or conversation with to to participate okay but my question is that company that, that does not participate yes. what's going to happen to that litter on that farm if the grower cannot move it it would not be eligible for the transport program the way it is structured today all right if i had to take it to a state land what would happen to it if i have to take it to state lands do you pay to get it there do i pay to get it there I think that's all to be determined. <laughs> and in fact, this is the, in but, fact, this is something that, that we're developing. So I don't have that. But my concerns detail. are, Royden, we're, we're putting regulations okay. into play, and this is my major mm -hmm. heartfelt concern. We are putting regulations into play right now. Today, we do not know. The state of Maryland cannot tell you how many no land poultry farmers even exist in these three lower counties. We do not have a number to tell you of how many tons of manure are even generated. We can only come up with those numbers by asking some of the local transporters. So we're going to take and transport manure. Half the money to transport it has to come from the integrator. How can the integrator even possibly come to you and say, well, I only need a million bucks this year or $2 million this year? What is the total proposed funds that are going to be needed to cover this? The budget today is $350,000 of state money matched by $350,000 of poultry company money. That's where we started this current year with. In addition, in addition to that, there's $500,000 of additional money that's been placed on the table. So you, you are correct. There was a period in late August, early September, where we had fully committed the dollars that the companies had ascribed to in their, in their contracts, in their agreements. We've gone back and had conversations with those companies, and two of the five, two of the four companies that will be participating have agreed to uh, extend their eligibility and make eligible their growers for the transport program. Regardless, to, to go back to your previous comment about even without, in, in, the, in the example where you have a grower growing for a company that's not participating in the program at all, that litter still has value, as, as we've talked about, as a crop nutrient. So with or without the transport money, that litter still has value to another farmer 
as a crop nutrient. But what is it going to cost to transport it to the upper shore or across the bridge? That, those are questions that really need to be answered before we implement. You know, we have a lot of farms out here that are CAFOs, but they're also crop farmers. Those folks have never really been a part of the manure transport operation, nor had a need to move their litter. And with up to 80% of the farms gone in this, these three lower counties, with the ability gone to spread litter, those folks also are going to have to find a place to take litter. And until we can fully anticipate how many tons we're moving, where we're going to give it, move it to, and how much money the integrators are going to have to come up with to do it, that's a serious problem. Another problem is that while we're spending this time looking around, figuring out where we're going to get it out, how we're going to get it off the farm, I lose money. I make my income based on having birds in the houses. Mm -hmm. And I don't turn birds, I don't flip them like pancakes, but it's nice to get them back in three weeks. You know, I can live with two to three weeks. Some folks with mortgages, with new farms, they can't go three weeks. If they go three weeks, they are going to lose their farm. Manure barns only hold approximately 180 days worth of litter. I do a 60-day bird. A 60-day bird is going to fill my barn up in less than six months. Once that's filled, I'm going to be sitting there saying, how am I getting the litter out? Currently, I found a farmer. If I hadn't found a farmer, I would have had to have someone cake the houses out. That cake out would have run on those eight houses approximately $1,300. If I have to cake out eight, five times a year, four or five times a year, then pay someone to put it in the barns, then find someone to track it over the bridge, plus the amount of time that I will be out of birds, ballparking, not knowing the cost of transporting it elsewhere on the shore or across the shore, or bridge, I'm figuring just on my operation, which isn't a big one, probably $45,000 a year in loss. That's a lot of bucks. And it's, you know, this is something that's not only going to be felt by me, it's going to be felt by the guy that does my poultry house repairs. It's going to be felt when I go into town to buy food, when I go to buy supplies. This is going to have a, a very hurtful ripple effect throughout the economy. And, and I guess what I'm saying, you know, we're going to implement. We are in a rush to implement. But before we make things regulations, we really need to find out what the impact's going to be. And I know you guys have been working on it, but I think we just need to do more. Thank you. Thank you. Take one out of the back. We've been up front. Lee?